Let's talk about cannons. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So here we're looking at, uh, again, the film The Patriot, Mel Gibson's film, but we're not going to really talk about the film in specific. We're talking about cannons and cannon shots and how they're portrayed in film and TV. And this is, as a military historian and fan of all things that go bang or slice, um, this is something that has bothered me for many, many years. Um, in fact, since I was a kid, really, since I worked out how cannons work and the different ways that cannons are used in warfare. And one of the problems is that in film and TV, cannon fire is a logistical problem. How do you represent it? You can show a gun going bang, but how do you show the end results? If you have CGI, these days you can show realistically what cannons did to people. You might not want to show it because of the rating of the film or just because you think it would be too sickening to see, quite frankly. Um, but how you represent it artistically, shall we say, is somewhat of a challenge. And the way that we're going to see it's uh, being represented here um, is actually the typical way of how this is shown in film. Um, essentially, well, let's have a look. It's, um, it's a way that doesn't, to my mind, really represent the reality of the cannon fire that would happen in this moment in this scene. Let's have a look. Artillery, concentrate on the centre, drive them back. So there we've got, it's the filmmaker's favourite, it's the big old puff of earth or puff of smoke. And of course it's easy to do if you're making a movie because you film a cannon going bang, which is of course a blank, it's not shooting anything out of it apart from black powder smoke. Um, and then of course you have an explosive charge placed in the ground or a smoke detonator that goes poof like this. Now in this case it makes almost no sense at all because um, if we look at the, uh, the British lines are here, so the, this is the, the thin, thin red line of British soldiers and behind there are, um, are the Americans, the enemy, <laughs> and uh, there the Americans are attacking towards the camera here and we've been ordered to shoot fire our guns um, at the Americans. Well, why is the big plume of smoke happening behind the British line? Well, some of you might say, oh, it's the first bounce of ball. So what are the three types of, well, there are more, but the three principal types of um, thing that gets projected or shot out of a cannon? Well, number one, we've got ball. Now, ball is literally a solid, solid iron ball um, used both on land and at sea, and it is the most accurate um, form of projectile out of a cannon. It's very good for anti-personnel at long range, and it will bounce along literally like a, like a golf ball um, through the enemy lines. And of course, if there's fortifications or ships or anything else in the way. So it's literally like shooting a very high speed golf ball through the opponents. Okay, that's the first one. The second one, um, at usually at a slightly shorter range, is an explosive shell. Um, now this is sometimes involves um, sometimes what's known as a shrapnel shell um, and there are essentially two types that were commonly used. There's one type that um, it's it, anti-personnel type that's designed to explode in the air above the enemy. So in this case if that was an explosive shell what we would expect to see is the shell going <laughs> hopefully far beyond your own lines, uh, over the enemy lines and then going bang um, above their heads and showering them with shrapnel. So it's essentially like having a landmine go off above your head. You can imagine that would be pretty damn effective. That's not what this is. The second type of explosive shell is um, one that explodes upon impact. So we could say, well that's what this is. We could say that's what movies are usually showing, this type of shell that explodes on impact. But then why would it be behind your own lines? You wouldn't be uh, shooting an explosive shell that hits the ground behind your own lines and explodes and showers your guys with shrapnel. Even more than that, if your guys were in combat with the enemy guys, you can see there's only maybe 30 or 50 yards between them, you wouldn't be shooting explosive shell at the enemy because you'd be showering your own line with, um, with shrapnel. Now, some of you might say, ah oh, yes, but he's a real bastard and maybe he's just, he doesn't care about his own men, he just wants to wipe out the enemy. Well, all, be, all well and good, in that case the shot has gone very, very far short and he's only going to wound his own men. But in this situation that doesn't make any sense because look at his line, is a nice, long, organised 
um, thin, thin red line of, of uh, British red coats. And it, why would you shoot into your own men? At the moment, they seem to be holding the line. So, uh, in actual fact, what you would use if you had a direct line of sight at the enemy and they were relatively close, that means usually up to about 100 yards, is the third type of projectile you shoot out of the cannon, and that is um, grape shot or shot or canister. Um, there, are, there are slight variations in the types used. Some are in a, um, so we're talking about small balls. Essentially, imagine like large musket balls. A large number of them, maybe um, about 100 of them, contained in something. There are some that are made of a canvas bag, some that's a metal tin, um, but the basic idea is you're turning your cannon into a shotgun, a giant shotgun. And what you're doing, it's like having a whole bunch of um, musket men all fire at once. Um, uh, and yeah, so if you've got a direct line of sight, so potentially maybe the cannon, if it could see the enemy on a rise up here, if he felt confident in his gunnery um, skills, could shoot over the heads of his own men and shower the opponents with grape. Personally, I don't think that would be safe to do because you can't dictate the exact direction of grape and it's really best used or most safely used if you have a direct, unobstructed view at the enemy. If you have any of your own troops in front, don't use grape because you'll hit some of them, okay? So there we go. So the main way that um, cannon fire is portrayed in film and TV is with a big puff of smoke. Right, you'll actually see. So what we saw in this scene was uh, a big puff of smoke. What is that smoke? If it was a real, I mean, I know it's, it's a smoke. <laughs> it's a smoke bomb. It's a movie, but don't, don't for a minute think that I don't accept that this is, you know, this is one way of dealing with cannon fire for a mass audience in a movie. I completely accept that. But what we see here, if we're judging it from a military history and realism point of view, is a uh, puff of smoke here and then a puff of smoke up there. What does that represent? We could say, well, I, uh, perhaps it's supposed to show a cannonball bouncing here and hitting that building. Well then, what are they doing shooting a ball uh, over the heads, you know, hitting before their own men. That would be quite crazy. But equally, why would it make a puff of smoke up on this building? Very curious. But just so next, I'm sure I've now partially ruined some of the historical movies that some of you will be watching, because whenever you see cannon fire, the effects of cannon fire, it's usually this big puff of white smoke. Well, clearly you wouldn't get white smoke out of the ground, out of the earth, and clearly you wouldn't get white smoke out of this red brick building. Here we're back at the final battle again, the Battle of Cowpens, which is 1781, I believe. And um, again, we see more puffs of smoke. And not only are they large puffs of smoke, they never seem to do any damage to anyone. And they're in very strange locations. One of the things to note about artillery, cannons, is they could be incredibly accurate, okay? Not to say they always were, but um, certainly the degree of inaccuracy shown here is completely unrealistic. If you've got an entire army over there, it's not that difficult to put a, a shell or a ball in their vicinity, very, very close to them, enough to cause some minor casualties or wounds. And, um, you know, if, if one ship can shoot at another ship and have a good hit rate, then over quite large distances, clearly over the relatively small distances that we're dealing about here, dealing with here, so up to about a thousand yards, usually it'd be kind of 500 to 800 yards, it's not easy to put, um, not difficult to put shells or ball into or near the opponents. So here we, Mel Gibson arrives on his horse and we've got the typical, wait for it, boom, poof. That was far quicker than that uh, shell could have arrived there. So notice that the bang of the cannon went off far too close to the um, puff of smoke. Now, what are they doing shooting there? Seriously, just look at, so, <laughs> we presumably we've got the, the British uh, guns are shooting over the heads or perhaps from either side of the advancing British here at the American lines and they're, my, they're so far away, it's unbelievable, okay? Um, and also, we're dealing with these explosive shells that are going boom. At this distance, we should really be using ball, okay? Because the great thing about ball, of course, is it bounces. And um, 
if, especially as we seem to have the high ground, I say we, the British, the British seem to have the high ground, so they're shooting downhill, which is fairly good. Uh, it does mean sometimes the ball's going to plow into the ground and not bounce as far as you like, but it's better than shooting uphill because uphill it will always plow into the ground, okay? That was one of the features that Wellington seems to have made use of at the Battle of Waterloo uh, to, to reduce the effectiveness of Napoleon's guns. It also assisted that in that it had been um, really, really torrential rain for a long period beforehand and so the ground was very soft and sucked up and absorbed those cannonballs. But here we've got hard, dry ground, the balls will bounce well. And so really what we want to be doing is shooting balls down that go bump, 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 vum and through the American lines and wiping out um, rebels as we go. And instead we're doing what's essentially like mortar fire with an explosive shell nowhere near the enemy and going poof, it's completely wasted, wasted time, wasted shot. Um, but you know, that's what movies love. They love a big puff of smoke to represent cannon fire. And again here we've got bang, poof. So we saw the shot coming in, big cloud of smoke, caused no casualties. Where was the shrapnel? I do like the hats though, I have to say. Why didn't that injure anyone? Big puff of smoke, there should be shrapnel coming out there. Another big puff of smoke, curiously in the same place. Do you think that they had a device set in the ground there? Probably. Big puff of smoke between the lines, How, like what are they shooting at exactly? No casualties. So essentially this is one of the big problems with movies and TV is that we see lots of big puffs of smoke. But what does that represent? Well the only thing that it can represent in real artillery terms is an explosive shell. And the whole point of an explosive shell is that there are two types, basically two types. Either it explodes in the air above the enemy or it explodes on impact with the ground in front of or in the enemy. And what comes out of it? Shrapnel. It's, it's like a flying landmine. That is the whole point of that thing, is to th throw shrapnel like a bomb everywhere around it. And here, just like in, if you watch the series Sharp, um, Sharp's Rifles and so on, um, then it's exactly the same thing in there. Lots of puffs of smoke, clearly no shrapnel coming out of that smoke, and in this case, an awful lot of cannon fire for very little result. What I would love to see, now that we have the ability to use uh, CGI far more affordably in TV and film, is to see cannonballs, balls, used far more extensively because they were one of the most widely used projectiles from artillery in this era. And what the ball does is it goes bounce, 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 wreck right the way through the line of soldiers. So, uh, and it dictated warfare at the time as well because the ball did that against artillery fire you would form line. Why? Because if you form line, when the ball comes through your line, it does the minimum number of casualties. Against cavalry, you form square to defend yourself against the cavalry, but the square is vulnerable to the artillery because if you form square and the ball bounces through you, it's going to wipe out potentially two or even more times as many men. So this whole uh, rock, paper, scissors situation of forming square and forming line was absolutely intrinsic and critical to understanding combat and battles in this era. And if we don't show artillery fire having the effect that it actually did, then you lose that sense, you lose that logic. So I would absolutely love, and anybody who's making, whether it's documentaries or TV dramas or movies, who watches this, please, please, please put cannonballs into your movies because they were absolutely the most important type of missile coming out of cannons. They look cool and horrific and make the cannons and artillery far more impressive. And it completely explains why people fought in the way that they did in this era. Why they formed lines sometimes, why they formed square sometimes, why they didn't form square sometimes and it can add a, a narrative as well. You know, at the, uh, in Waterloo and in the Crimea, various other um, 
campaigns during this era, we see the use of artillery and cavalry together because if you can make the opponents form into square because of fear of cavalry, so ride cavalry towards them, they form into square, then you hit them with the guns and it all links together in much the same way as in modern warfare we use infantry and air power uh, in coordination. This is what they did. Their, their air power was their cavalry and um, their artillery and their cavalry and their infantry all worked together. So please, could we see less puffs of smoke and more cannonballs? Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.